Hi, everyone. Yeah, our talk's called Shall We Play a Game? Hacking and Weaponizing the NES Classic Mini, which we'll look at in a moment. My name is Ross. I've been involved with B-Sides a bit before, spoken previously uh, here and at ZedeCon, and gave this talk recently in Joburg at HexCon. By day, I'm a web security and dev guy, so very much involved in the software world, which is not what the NES Classic is, which is why Dale's here. Um, and yeah, so let Dale introduce. Hi, I'm Dale. Uh, I'm a software developer by day and I guess a hardware hacker by night. Um, yeah, I uh, got invited to do the talk to help out on the hardware side. And yeah, that's it. So we're both really keen in uh, retro computing and consoles. So the NES, as you may know from your childhood, was this old 8-bit device. And we like hacking, breaking, making, fixing stuff. So that's kind of how this talk came about. So combination of the stuff that we like, but I also found this device to be quite a cool way to look into embedded device hacking, which is not something I know about at all. Like I said, I just know about the software side of things. You'll hear just now there's sort of multiple layers to this, which is why I think it's such an interesting device. It's also quite uh, affordable and easily accessible, so you can still buy these on take a lot. They cost a grand, which is a bit of money, but it's not ridiculous. It's not a hard to find device. You know, if you try and get into embedded device hacking, there's a lot of guides, but very few sort of step-by-step -step things like buy this product, buy this product, plug them together, type this command, and now you know stuff. It's quite abstract. There's like router hacking. You have to try and find the router. Whereas here, I'm kind of hoping that we can present, here's a device and a bunch of steps that you can go home and replicate. You don't have to bring stuff in from Amazon, like I said, available and take a lot. And if nothing else, the device is fun to play with. So you've actually got something that you can hold on to, give to your kids, or just enjoy. Unless you break it. <laughs> So about the NES Mini, this is not the Nintendo you may have grown up with. It's modeled after it, so it's got the same look and feel with the controller, but it's been drastically resized. It's made a lot smaller, but um, yeah, it looks a lot like the original one that you would have had, especially if you were in America. Um, it's not able to play original cartridges. Like I said, it's not hard to find. If you go onto Gumtree or eBay, you'll find people selling these for like four and a half thousand rand. Don't buy it there. They obviously think it's some kind of rare collector's item. It's certainly not yet, still in production, still available. Don't pay a fortune for it. It's also not just a Raspberry Pi. Yes, you can do things like Retro Pi, but if you add up the cost of a Raspberry Pi, a case, a controller, an SD card, getting it all working, you're pretty much at the grand mark anyway. So this is just an all-in-one device that just works, no moving parts, no corrupt SD cards. If you want a Raspberry Pi for Raspberry Pi reasons, by all means, get it. I'm not saying this is a replacement, but for a gaming console, I definitely think this is uh, a great way to go. It's also not meant to be modified or customized. So there's no moving parts. You can't insert the original cartridges. You can't insert anything other than the cables they give you. So it's intended to be sold as a like desktop box that you plug in and use as is, which is why we have this talk, because we do not want to just use it like that. So it's USB powered, HDMI output, and comes in various models. So um, that's the one that you're likely to find on Take A Lot. It looks more like the American model. If you had a knockoff Famicom growing up like I did, that's the shape that you would have. This is available on Amazon, but it's targeted at the Japanese market. They've also brought, brought out Super Nintendos. Um, it's basically all the same parts inside, just different cases and different ROMs. That's the European Super Nintendo, and you also get the North American Super Nintendo. So they do different things, different ROMs, but all the internals are pretty much the same. Um, so as I mentioned, I think it comes with 30 games. It's got a basic UI for selecting the game that you want to play. They use their own built-in emulator called Hackchi Hackchi. So although it's their hardware from Nintendo, it is still emulation under the hood. And they use a common programming uh, set of libraries called SDL and other open source tools, which they make available, but not really in a way that you can recompile the UI or the platform. So they're sort of satisfying the legal requirements of providing the source codes but not providing their whole like development environment or tool chain. But that's their official link if you want to go and look at their um, source code that they've used. So this is the UI when you boot up. You've got some config options along the top to sort of change your video output and things like that. But ultimately, you've got this long ribbon that you scroll through for selecting the ROM that you want to play. In this case, Super Mario Bros. 1 is selected. And they've got a fairly good range that it ships with. So now let's do some software hacking. I mentioned that I'm a software guy. I don't like the idea of soldering onto uh, my board or, or breaking my device that I spent a grand on. So um, just sticking within the software world quickly, there's a great mod called Hackchi. It was originally made by a guy called Mad Monkey. 
and there have been three separate revisions. So he sort of created this program, somebody else picked it up and took it a bit further, and now there's sort of more of a community effort taking it into its third generation. The first one looked like that, uh, some buttons on the side to do pretty complicated things, not very user-friendly, but um, it allowed you to do some hacking of the device. That got revised by a guy called Cluster M, so it does all the same things under the hood, but it gives you this interface where you can add custom ROMs, make various changes, hide some of the built-in ROMs, and that's then been forked into a community edition. Much of the same functionality, but a few extras, and this one's seeing more active development than the previous one. So this is the one that you want if you want to modify one of these devices. The same software works for all four of those devices that I mentioned, the NES and the Super NES. So what it does is it changes the firmware, changes startup scripts, uh, remaps some paths, and ultimately allows you to put custom NES ROMs on the device. So it's sort of changing the normal behavior, but not necessarily putting your device at risk. So as I mentioned, custom ROMs, I made one for AP Sites game in 2016. So here's a little video snippet of it visible in the ribbon and playing in their emulator. So that's, I guess, sort of the first use case that you would have for wanting to hack your device, putting all your favorite ROMs onto it. It's got some USB functionality if you have the right adapter. So Dale's going to speak about USB OTG host mode. Um, it's quite difficult to find the right adapter. These 90 degree adapters seem to work really well. They're just a little tricky to find. And you have to make sure that you get the right orientation. The HDMI and the micro USB adapters are pretty close together. So um, the image on the left you just can't plug the HDMI adapter in after plugging micro USB in, which is a little inconvenient. You can also get USB storage working if you want to put a whole lot of ROMs onto it. Also not very easy. Um, there's that GitHub link where there's a tool that will format your flash drive correctly. NTFS seems to work well, although there's FAT32 and XFS support um, when the hack tree mods your device. And not all flash drives seem to work, but the SanDisk Cruiser Blades available on Take A Lot do seem to work pretty well and they end up mounting into slash media when you've got access to the device. So we'll mention that a bit later. So you can kind of add on storage to the device. Um, the HackG mod also gives you FTP and SSH support. It creates host-only networking on that IP, 169.254.1337, and you can SSH in as root. So at that point, your device is rooted, which is obviously the goal. But if you followed the uh, McAfee hardware wallet, <laughs> Like, so what? You got root. What are you going to do with it? Was uh, sort of his response to those hackers rooting his hardware wallet. So what are we going to do with it? I said, I'm a software guy. I've spoken on game hacking before. I quite like the idea of hacking games. And who doesn't want to hack Super Mario Bros. 1? So normally when you're hacking a game, you want to do things like scan the memory, find a value, change a value in memory, change program behavior. But how do you do that on this device you know nothing about? You don't have any tools. You don't have like a Linux desktop environment to use. It ships with BusyBox, which uh, if you know anything about it, it's like a super stripped down of some of the common Linux tools. And yeah, so with very little tooling, I wanted to see what I was able to do. And as it turns out, using just Bash and some of these tools, you can get the process ID of the Nintendo emulator. Within the virtual path, you can get that process's memory map. And highlighted there, you see the heap. So in the second or third column, the different sections of memory have different permissions on them. You can't just go and read all the memory, otherwise the device resets and does weird things. But the heap contains all the interesting values that we care about. So when it's emulating a game and you have a number of lives, that's going to exist somewhere in the heap. So that's kind of cool. Like Now we can see stuff with almost no tooling. But if we go a step further, we can actually read that whole chunk of memory and write it to file using just some basic tools. So we've got cat, we've got grep, we've got awk, we've got dd, and now we're able to dump the whole emulator's memory to disk. So now we can start analyzing and poking at it. If we can read all of it, we can read just a byte of it. So this is just a helper script that I have that some other scripts use where I'm able to give it an address and pull a byte out of memory. And I was quite pleased to find you can do the opposite. Not only can you use DD to read, but you can also use DD to write. So I've got the inverted script that pushes a byte to a certain offset in memory. So now we can start messing with this emulator and start changing games with, again, zero tooling other than the basics that HackG gives us. So I've installed a mod here by a guy called CompCom. What it does is it listens for a controller input when you've got the device running, shows a custom graphical uh, menu over the normal interface, 
And from there, you can quite easily script your own things. So what I've got, you'll see in a moment, is a custom menu that's running custom bash files using those bash files that we just looked at. So um, here, I'm on world 4.2 in Super Mario Brothers 1. I've got 36 coins, and just running a little script of mine, this is the custom menu, and it's run my bash script that's just read certain memory addresses in order to output effectively to terminal those values. Maybe not so valuable, but um, as we'll hear just now, think of this as a different embedded device. Think of this as a security system or a medical system or something like that. Separate from what's going on in the game, some other tools can extract all these pieces of information. Maybe there's like hard-coded passwords or creds or something like that. Something else we can do is trigger events based on in-game activity. So the emulator is not open source. We cannot compile the emulator. We've not reverse engineered the emulator. But we can pause the emulator and trigger custom events when certain events happen. So by watching a value in memory, in this case, the size of Mario, whether you've got the mushroom, whether you've got the firepower, we can basically set hooks that pause the emulator and do custom things. In this case, it's going to play some videos when we get the mushroom and when we get the firepower. And the emulator is not aware of any change. The time is literally the whole emulator just pauses. We're using uh, just the Linux process tools just to pause that thread and then resume it. So we've literally hooked into an app without sort of modifying the app in any way. Game Genie codes are super fun on Nintendo. It's basically a way that you can cheat. Hacktree does allow you to patch your ROMs when you're putting them onto the device. But what if you want to dynamically turn them on and off? So at the end of the day, a game genie cheat is just a patch to memory. So I've written a script that does exactly that. It takes an offset and a code, and it pushes a value into memory. And I've wired it up to the same little web uh, custom UI. So here I've lost the, the mushroom power because an enemy's hit me. Jump into the custom menu, enable invincibility game genie cheat. And now the state of the game has been changed. We've patched the actual game logic, which is running inside the emulator, which is running inside this embedded device, all just from a bash script with no custom tooling. So that's sort of the software side and some fun we can have. Um, like I said, the value for me is I don't have to do any soldering, open anything up. Uh, this tooling that pre-exists has allowed me to SSH in and tamper with it. But there are multiple more layers at which you can sort of attack this device. And this is where Dale's going to explain some of those. OK. <clears throat> the way to think of this device is it's not, although it looks like a console and everything else, it's basically a tablet without a screen. Um, it runs a system on chip made by Allwinner. Um, Allwinner make a range of uh, chips normally used in tablets. Uh, it's, Allwinner is an interesting company. They basically license all the technology uh, from the various manufacturers like ARM, etc., and then build these chips. But they don't actually um, manufacture them. They just re-license it to places like TSMC who manufacture the chips. Otherwise, on this device, um, there's a 256-meg RAM chip, a 512-meg uh, NAND flash storage chip, a little power management chip that makes sure that everything boots up and powers up and supplies all the voltages, and an HDMI chip. Um, the HDMI is required because this particular all-winner R16 is what they call the IoT version. And basically, it means it's got no HDMI output. So it only outputs LVDS and a few other formats. And then uh, the HDMI chip converts that and displays it on the screen. The reason that I got interested in this device was because the same chip or similar chipsets are used in devices like uh, tablets and things like that. So the other nice thing about all winner chips is all, all winner chips have this FEL recovery mode. It's um, baked into the actual chip. It's not part of uh, any of the other storage, which allows you to get low-level access to the device, poke memory, um, stuff like that. Uh, it's the SNES and the NES and the, that has a USB port on the back that's normally used for power. The catch is that that port's wired into the um, all winner's USB uh, on-the-go port, which means that because it's on-the-go on port, you can use it with the right cable and that to actually access the chip and do other things over that USB connection. Um, <clears throat> with the correct kernel modules and that kind of thing, you can run a network connection over that USB connection. You can also make this device show up as a mass storage device or as a serial device or as a keyboard or anything else like that. Um, 
OTG is an interesting USB standard. It basically allows you to take what uh, a device to be both a client and a host. So modern day phones will do this kind of thing where um, you can take, normally you would plug something, an external device in, and your, your device is acting as, say, the client. So um, you take your phone, you plug it into a PC, it shows up as a mass storage device. But then OTG allows it with the right cable, the right settings to mount, for example, plug the flash drive into the bottom of the phone. This device has that capability as well. So this is the internals of one of these Nest Classics. Now, all of these models all look more or less the same. Each revision, they just tweak a few things and make it slightly cheaper each time around. Uh, on the left is just a, the, in the top half is a, couple of, a board for a couple of the buttons and stuff like that. So on the right is the main board, all nicely hidden behind shielding. If you take all the shielding off, you'll see that's the main board. When I say there's not a lot on this thing, there isn't. Um, there's four chips on the side of the board. Top left is the power chip. The big one is the all winner chip. The one below that's the RAM, and the one to the left of that is the flash. That's it. There's a couple other little bits and pieces here and there, small passive components and that, but there's not much on it. Uh, if you look on the other side of the chip, there's the HDMI port and the HDMI transceiver, and that's it. There's no other real components. There's a little bit for power and things like that. So from a, a hacking point of view, this thing's all in one. It's basically just the all-winner chip and the small little bits, extra, external bits and pieces. So this is the actual layout of the all-winner chip. As you can see, it's got four A7 ARM Cortex chips. Um, so it's a quad-core chip. It's got the Mali GPU, which as far as I can tell, isn't really used in the uh, NES. Unfortunately, anyone who's played with this kind of stuff, this Mali GPU isn't open source. So you need a binary blob to make use of it and get any kind of hardware acceleration. Uh, the display outputs, as I said, it's got LVDS and a few others, um, but it doesn't have HDMI. Uh, the connectivity, there are a bunch of GPIO or general purpose IO pins. Those are used for the buttons on the external side and that. There is a SPI um, bus that's not really used. There's a UART bus, which is serial, which I'll talk about later. Um, TWI is similar to a protocol called I2C, um, but basically that's being used to uh, connect the controllers. The controllers used on the NES are very similar to the old Nintendo Wii controllers. Um, they just tweaked a few things so they're not quite compatible, but you know, find a way to sell a few more. As I say, this is basically like a tablet chipset. So it's got camera, but it's not used. It's got a whole bunch of security features, including um, locked bootloaders, signed bootloaders, all that kind of stuff. None of those features are actually implemented on this device. So from a beginner's, I want to hack something, this thing is wonderful because they, it's just hard enough that it's not, you know, you, you have to work a little bit to get into it. But there's no, you're not breaking weird, you know, uh, crypto stuff or anything like that. Otherwise, it's got a DDR interface to some RAM and like I say, the flash and the audio codec and things like that. So this is the layout of the internal, how everything's wired up. I won't go into all the detail. You'll note there's a MMC there. That's actually an SD card. The device doesn't have an SD card inside. However, the pins are broken out to little test points. And if you're brave, you can solder on an SD card and get it to work in this device. Um, if you go and search around, you'll find a few people have done that. I'm not sure I'm that brave yet, but one day I'll get around to it. Um, the other interesting thing is you'll note that things like the power button and the reset and that are just wired into GPI opens. Um, the same as with tablets and phones and thing, devices like that, pushing the power button doesn't actually cut the power. All it does is send a signal to some demon running in the background that says, hey, switch off, and then your machine quietly shuts down. This device works the same way. So um, it, even when you put your uh, switch it off with the power switch, it doesn't actually turn off, it shut, runs a shutdown script and shuts the machine down. So you can actually halt the shutdowns and all those kind of things. You can grab the reset and do your own thing when you push the reset button if you like. Okay, so when you're hacking a Linux device, uh, whether it's one of these things, a phone, um, a router or anything like that, the, the main thing when you're looking for an embedded device everyone wants is the serial console. Um, the reason you want your serial console is generally um, it gives you access to things like the U-boot, the Linux console, and things like that. 
which you wouldn't normally be able to see on screen. So on this one, uh, I thought it would, it's normally hidden on board. It's um, depending on the manufacturer. Sometimes they mark it, most of the times they don't. Um, on this particular one, it runs at uh, 115200 board at 3.3 volt. And uh, you just need a USB to serial adapter, um, one in the FTDI or the CH430 or any of those kind of things um, that you would use to hack normal hardware. All of these things are easily um, findable. So when I opened this particular device, I was hoping that I, was, I had all my stuff out and then I turned the board over and they marked on the back. The original um, NES Classic doesn't have them marked. But it turns out that when they did the revision, uh, they decided to mark all the pins, which makes my life a lot easier. Um, so when you, once you've got your serial console on uh, and you power the thing up, you'll see on there, uh, there's U-Boot starts up right in the top, gets a little bit lower. You'll see there's a mention there of no battery. That's why I say this is actually a tablet device. Um, all over the system, you'll see little hints that, oh, it's looking for a battery, it's looking for things like that. Uh, lower down, eventually U-Boot then launches into the Linux kernel and the system will boot, eventually giving you a normal logging prompt. Now, the magic of this device and of the all winner things is this FEL mode. FEL is very, very nice from a hardware hacking point of view. You can't brick the device. Uh, FEL is in a boot ROM on the all winner chip, although it might be possible to override it. Generally speaking, even if you do something stupid, you won't remove that bit. As long as you can make your way back into FEL mode, you can restore all your configuration, your firmware, everything else from there. Um, on, with FEL mode, uh, <laughs> so you can do various things like read memory, you can execute code, and stuff like that. So uh, let's skip that one. So, what I did was FEL mode is used by all the things that Ross was talking about, um, the Hakachi and those things. They've wrapped this FEL system so that they can program the device. Uh, what I decided to do was I wanted to know how Hakachi worked. Now, if any of you have ever been uh, tried to do this kind of thing, when you look at someone else's project, you'll see that they generally all open source. The one thing they forget to do is document anything. <laughs> this thing is no different. Um, so in the end, I managed to figure out how they were doing all the hacks and I decided to make them all just as a series of bash scripts rather so that I knew what was going on. Uh, Sun XIFEL is the Linux or Windows command line tool that um, talks to FEL mode. Uh, the FES1.bin, so when you're in FEL mode on this device, the RAM is not initialized. So basically you switch the device on, you put it into FEL mode and then you can't do anything on the device. Uh, you can't access RAM or anything like that because it's not initialized. So the first step is you upload this FES1.bin, which contains a smaller bit of code that initializes the RAM. After it's initialized the RAM, it then puts the device into this FES mode, which uh, basically allows you to, to read and write longer string or longer bytes of me um, memory than you used to be able to under pure FEL mode. So you push that on, you execute it, and if you're watching on your serial console, you'll see it does that. Um, what it's doing there is just setting up the timing for the RAM. Once you've got that loaded and executed, you've now got access to the entire RAM space. So you can now start doing other things. So the next step is you load U-Boot. U-Boot is a bootloader. So the boot process on this thing is it loads the boot ROM, which contains the FEL and a few other little bits and pieces. The boot ROM initialized jumps to a certain point, initializes the RAM, and then hunts down U-Boot. U-Boot then loads into memory. U-Boot then gets the NAND storage up and running, and then from there, hands over to the Linux kernel, and the kernel carries on. So what you do uh, to dump this device is you compile your own U-Boot. You push your U-Boot onto the device. You then patch U-Boot, and that middle line is the magic line that it took me a while to figure out. You basically patch the U-Boot code so that in memory on the device so that U-Boot no longer runs its normal Linux boot uh, process. It runs that command instead. What that command does is sets up the NAND storage. Once you've done that, you can now just do that and dump the kernel. That's now reading straight off the NAND storage. You can dump the kernel image off of that. From there, it's hacking like any normal embedded device. You can take the, the kernel image apart pull out all the bits and pieces like the key file and that kind of thing and then decrypt the rest of the storage. 
If you want to write all this stuff back, you just change the read to a write, put your new kernel on, and you can push it to the device. And that's it. Cool. So the other part of the talk is actually weaponizing this. So um, be it a device that you want to have in your house for plausible deniability is just a gaming console, or perhaps be it a device in your home or business that you think is totally harmless. Um, it may actually be something far more sinister on your network. So we've looked a little bit of the sort of game hacking, but let's let's try and make this more about sort of cybersecurity. I guess to weaponize it, you really need to give it some connectivity. At the moment, it's just a device that talks to your screen to show pretty pictures. We mentioned that uh, you can do host-only networking with it, which isn't too exciting. Even if we got networking without tools, it's kind of pointless. And as I said, maybe it's something malicious on your network. So if, we, if an attacker put those things on it, what if they backdoored it? So we had a look already how we can hook the emulator and do various things. Um, in the same way, if somebody were able to backdoor your device, it could be doing all kinds of things without you noticing while still just playing uh, games for you. So in terms of the connectivity, there's a mod that you can get for HackG called WPA Supplicant. And it's basically your Linux Wi-Fi tools, enough to boot the, wi uh, the Wi-Fi protocol. You need the correct OTG cable and adapter. Those are the, the things that I showed you earlier. So it plugs into the micro SD, it breaks out to a full USB adapter, and then you're able to plug a network dongle in. The RTL 8188 seem to work. They're easily available on eBay and all over the place. They're quite popular and they just work really well. What you have to do with all those components in place is drag the WPA supplicant mod into HackG to install it. I'll show you a screen of that in a moment. Then you SSH in, you run a bash script that they've provided, and enter all your Wi-Fi um, credentials. The problem with this is there's no indicator that it works. After you've run the script, you have to reboot your device and just kind of hope and pray that it logs onto the Wi-Fi. So when you drag the mod into HackG, it props up this option. You select the mod bottom left that you want to install, tells you a bit about it and who made it, and that will then put these extra files on your NAS. You then SSH in, log in as root with no password. You run the Wi-Fi setup script, it asks you for your SSID and your password, and the instructions there are really long-winded, but you literally have to turn off the device, plug in your OTG adapter, plug in your NAS, uh, sorry, plug in your Wi-Fi adapter, and then give it power. The problem is these OTG adapters break connectivity over the USB data line, so you can't both be connected to HackG or SSH and be on your Wi-Fi network. So this device effectively vanishes from your connectivity until it shows up on your network, and it doesn't output anything over HDMI, so you also can't see what IP it's been assigned. So you need to kind of like find your DHCP um, allocations on your router to try and find the thing or scan it, but if all works well, it behaves much the same as it used to. You can FTP and SSH in. And the upside is then you have a device which is actually now Wi-Fi and internet enabled. So adding tools to it, I mean, Wi-Fi is fine, but you can't do anything without some extra tools. Um, there's a site called HackG Resources, which gives you all kinds of mods and extra emulators and games and things like that. But they've also got an experimental section where they provide some additional wireless tools and network tools and GDB. So there's a few things there which might be a little bit interesting to, to play with, but what about adding our own tools? So uh, a tool I use quite often is GoBuster. Its job is to brute force files and directory paths on web servers to discover things that developers probably don't want you to find. It's written in Go, which happens to be really, really, really easy to compile uh, or cross-compile to this device. So there's a bunch of command line options there that you run once you've downloaded the source code. But most importantly, you're telling it to compile for ARM version 7 statically. And the output file at the bottom is identified as an ARM static library. So you can just drag that across to the NAS or FTP it across. And here I am running it again through that uh, custom UI. Obviously, you wouldn't really use that because you can't specify a host. But just for illustrative purposes that this is really running on the NAS and not just an SSH terminal, here is that binary that I've compiled, copied across, and run against my site. Luckily, just a robots.txt file found. If you don't want to um, compile stuff yourself, you can sort of pick up binaries and copy them across. So Kali Linux is available for ARM HF, which is the chipset this needs. Um, and you can run that ARM HF on the Raspberry Pi. So although they've got the Raspberry Pi images, you can also run these. And obviously, Kali comes bundled with a whole lot of tools. So let's go and grab Nmap. But first, if we check the file output of it, we see bottom left-hand corner, it's a dynamic binary, which isn't too problematic. Like, we're halfway there. It's an ARM that we can run. 
The problem with dynamic libraries is they come with a whole lot of dependencies, and this isn't even the full list. So if you run LDD on Nmap on your Raspberry Pi against Nmap, you see all these other libraries that you need to bring across. So okay, you go and copy all these pods across, get them off your Pi onto your PC, from your PC push them onto the NAS, and then finally you can run them, um, putting them all in the same directory and using an environment variable, LD library path. You can tell it, hey, don't go look on the NAS's file system for these libraries, they're all right here. So it's, you've kind of made like a static folder of an app, although it's not a static binary. And uh, you're then able to run it in the command line. Once again, I've hooked up a bash script to the custom UI. So here's nmap running against itself on the NES Classic. So Kat, uh, Rogan mentioned a bit earlier, this sort of speaks to the backdooring side of things. Uh, just a very super useful networking tool for joining various ports and protocols, and you can do all kinds of crazy things with it. There is already Netcat as part of BusyBox on this device, so it's totally plausible you could actually set up a Netcat reverse shell on somebody's NES Classic, listening to the outside world and do all kinds of crazy piping, and they would really never know. Um, this also compiles pretty easily, as long as you're using the GCC on cross-compilation libraries. So you do need to change the config to do a static build. You need to change the make file to use the cross-compiler, not the standard GCC that you might have available. But then you can just run make, and again, you get a static binary ready for ARM that you can just copy across and run. There isn't really a way to show this, so I don't have a slide for that. Just to kind of compare the different compiling options, you could also compile stuff on your Raspberry Pi running Kali ARM HF. The problem is Raspberry Pis are not very powerful. You can spend a lot of time compiling things. So it works and it outputs the right file, but it's a pain. You can use GCC, which is a lot easier. You can use the cross compilation as I've shown there. The catch is you need GCC version 4.9 or lower. A lot of the newer Linux distros come with newer versions. So you've also kind of got this need for an old version of Linux. You might need newer libraries for the thing you're trying to compile, so it does get quite fiddly. There's another cross compilation option which I really like called docross, but this just doesn't work at all. It ends up outputting a binary for a newer version of the kernel, so you get a fatal kernel to old error when you bring the binary across onto the device. So don't go that way. So in the terms of compiling things, um, these slides. A little more about the hardware. Okay. These, uh, yeah, so these slides, the device shows up, uh, the screen shows up as a normal frame buffer, which means that you can compile normal applications and just write to a standard frame buffer to display things on the screen. Uh, the problem is, is that the built-in emulator is constantly, and UI is constantly drawing to the screen, so you have to pause or stop the standard emulator once you've done that. You can draw anything you like to the frame buffer. Uh, the joysticks show up, at, or the, the controllers show up as standard joysticks. So if you're used to using those on Linux, you have no problem controlling those. Uh, things like uh, reset buttons and stuff like that show up as normal inputs, um, USB button presses, stuff like that. Okay. Yeah, so uh, going on what Dale just said, we could write uh, an app that just constantly loops reading for events and listens for controller inputs to determine whether you push the left or right or A or B buttons. And it could then increment sort of a counter to determine what slide you're on and play a video or image without using a MacBook, just using the NES like we've done here. So our slides are running on a custom app, just interacting with the device and not using the MacBook at all. But thanks for watching. <laughs> So the way we're doing that is using FFmpeg, which is a popular uh, video file player. So this is almost a bash script. It's literally just checking if an MP4 with the right file name run, uh, exists, calling FFmpeg, and then it returns to our app. And the guys who made the initial uh, hack tree have a program called decode PNG, which takes a PNG file and outputs it to the frame buffer. And like I said, these slides are luckily running from the NES Classic. Um, so I think we've got a little bit more time. There's just like a whole lot of stuff to run through. The Hackchi mods are just tar, G, uh, just tar files, nothing special about them. So you can even go and look at the mods that are available. Um, you can have multiple firmwares on a single device. So your NES Classic can look like an SNES and a Famicom and all the rest. So that's quite fun. There's a very active Reddit and Discord community around this if you're interested. So that's definitely worth looking into. And there's even a VNC frame buffer app that you can run to kind of pipe the HDMI output to your screen. But it's really, really laggy with a lot of tearing. Uh, Dale mentioned the inputs and things like that are pretty much just software buttons. Uh, we did want to make a bot that would play joyst uh, 
sort of pre-play the joystick commands to play Mario, but that just didn't work out very well. Um, a popular mod is RetroArch. It's a popular emulator, and it supports all these different engines. So you can even run DOSBox on the NES. Um, yeah, Sega, Game Boy, all sorts. So this is why it's such a fun device to hack and mod. It can just play like all the things. And a whole lot of stuff sucked. So I'll let Dale cover that. <coughs> OK. So <clears throat> the hardest thing, uh, well, one of the hard first steps we had was trying to find one of these on-the-go adapters. Uh, on-the-go is relatively sort of, it's quite common nowadays. The problem is, is that uh, we have to power the device through the on-the-go on connector. So what happens is we had to go and find what they call an on-the-go host cable, I think. Uh, it's a little bit hazy as to what exactly it's called. But basically what it allows you to do is gives you the on-the-go USB portion plus allows you to put power in over the five volt and ground instead of taking it out like you normally would. Uh, one of the fun bits is this is all done, or the device detects this by um, putting a special resistor value on pin five of the little connector. And it appears that all the documentation we could find is incorrect. I built quite a few of these cables and none of them worked. And in the end, I think Ross stumbled across one magic adapter that kind of worked. So um, yeah, it's uh, interesting. USB and Wi-Fi, um, the problem with like uh, mounting USB drives or getting the Wi-Fi to work is you're doing it all blind, unless of course you are brave enough like I was to solder the serial console so you got the serial on. Otherwise you're doing it all blind, you don't know if it's working, it doesn't give you any kind of output to the screen. So um, it gets a little bit crazy the first few times, you know, it doesn't work, doesn't want to show up and that kind of thing. Um, if you're trying to build software for one of these devices, you'll see all over the internet people say, just use BuildRoot. Now, BuildRoot is this magic, I want to say one giant big series of hacks on top of hacks on top of hacks on top of hacks on top of undocumented hacks, all wrapped up in some sort of weird make script. Um, what it allows you to do is build an entire Linux system. It builds all the uh, cross-compilation cr cross um, stuff it needs. It then proceeds to build the kernel, the root file system, plus all the libraries, plus everything else it needs. And it's got this very cool menu system sort of based off of the uh, standard kernel uh, build menu. So you can select all the bits and pieces you want, click go, and it's supposed to build you an image. Um, now, Nintendo actually used this but Nintendo didn't release how they did it. They didn't release the build root configuration. They did release a bunch of their source. So in theory, um, you can take the same build, ver build root version, uh, stick all their source into it, um, write one or two little patches, and it should work. Kinda? I couldn't get that working. Then if you go and scour the internet, you'll find tons of people who reference it and say they got it working, here is my configuration. That link there is just one of the many you'll find. They also all missing some other key piece. Um, you can ask Ross, I spent two weeks or something every evening trying to get this thing to work. Eventually, I got build root kind of working. Um, my eventual aim was I wanted to get X Windows running on this device. Um, yeah, we'll get to that. So the other problem is you can't use the new versions of GCC. Um, the version that ships, or the, the kernel and everything else that ships on here, you need an older version of GCC, which means you either have to compile an old version or find an older version of Linux to build everything. Um, they use a standard SDL for all the graphics and that, except it's a particular version with a particular set of patches on, and if you don't compile against the same version, your code won't work. So um, again, like I say, I was trying to get build root working with the aim of building their version of SDL so we could compile and link against it. Um, <clears throat> the other thing about this console is it was never built to run anyone's software but Nintendo. So it will crash a lot. Um, if you pull too much memory, it crashes. If you max out the CPU, it crashes. Uh, if you do too many things at once, it crashes. If you look at it funny, it crashes. Um, if you're poking values in the memory, it crashes. If you have a bad USB supply, it crashes. Um, if you're using it as a games console, it works, it's rock solid, it will carry on working perfectly. If you start doing like we were, 
uh, you will spend a lot of time crashing. There's some cool tricks, um, one of which is you basically just constantly tail uh, the syslog, dump it to a file on your own machine over the network connection, do whatever you want, and when it crashes, hopefully it got a chance to log to syslog before it crashed, and you get to see a few lines of your error. Um, yeah, we, uh, I got pretty good at doing that, figuring out what was causing the problem, but yeah, so. These, uh, for those of you who download the slides, these are just some links on a working on-the-go adapter, uh, one on Amazon, one on eBay, where you can find all the community stuff um, and links to various resources. Otherwise, both Ross and I have written all our notes on those two sites. Um, on mine, you'll find all the notes on the hardware, plus all the FEL stuff and how to dump the, the kernel and all those kind of things. Um, I'll probably add build root on at some point. My aim is still, I want this thing to boot and run X, and that is my aim. Um, like I say, it's a Linux machine, um, but yeah, I still haven't quite gotten that one to work. That's that. Cool, thanks guys. I don't think we have time for questions, but we would love to talk to you. We do, okay, we've got time for a few questions. <laughs> No questions? You just want to talk to us afterwards about retro gaming and oh, hardware hacking? Mario. Yeah. So, um, early on in the talk, you mentioned uh, the stuff about case makers. Um, and you know, I know companies, certain companies uh, that make case makers do invest a lot of time and effort into uh, hardening their, their, their systems for security controls and flows, et cetera. Um, I think it's a question. I think the, the default chip security measures that weren't being used. Yeah, I mean, uh, in this particular case, um, so normally they'll do, the, you want the bare minimums. Um, signed bootloaders, you want to be able to boot signed code so that ideally you can't do it. Disable all the debug interfaces um, so that people can't just wire into it and pull information, um, which uh, there's a lot of those kind of sort of basic level things that, for example, on this device, they just never bothered. It may be because they wanted to sell more of them and hoped all the hackers would buy them. Um, but in general, you'll find that on a lot of devices where they just leave all the, like uh, JTAG gets enabled, left switched on, all the serial ports get left switched on, or uh, things like they'll boot any code you like. If you just implement the bare minimum, uh, you're probably ahead of a large portion of people already. Um, ja. And um, I, think, I think from a software point of view, this chip's very much geared towards Linux. So you're opening yourself up to all the kinds of tools that we mentioned there. I mean, the fact that Netcat just runs, that's, I mean, that's a backdoor device. So don't use a chip that can run Netcat. Um, it's probably the best way to keep the like, really low-hanging fruit away. Right at the back, like three. Um, <laughs> So, there's so much stuff that we wanted to do. Um, Basically, I just one page back, one frame. Microphone. Oh, one frame back. There. So this whole portion here um, is quite a bit of space. In theory, if you lob the uh, network adapter for Raspberry Pi, it will probably fit in that space. Um, yeah. So you could. Uh, the hacks I've seen where they add um, the SD cards, there's also space underneath the uh, board. So you could fit, um, the hacks I've seen is they'll break out, they put a small slot on the side, they put an SD card in the back behind this board, and then you can go and put like your Wi-Fi and everything on the top one. Um, you would want a USB hub as well so that you could still have USB out and various other things like that. So you could, and you could still get it all crammed into the, the case. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Supply chain. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Um. Yeah. If you. Yeah. So. 
Um, they're literally running an emulator here with all the ROMs. So you can go and download more ROMs off the net, put them on here, and uh, so there's been a bit of a contest for people seeing how many ROMs they can fit on without using USB storage, and you can get into the hundreds. Um, so yes, you can put all your favorite ROM games on there. The emulator's a little bit buggy. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's the, it's the, the mapping and stuff is a little bit wrong. So not every image, ROM image will work. But a bunch of people have written patches to make those that are incompatible with the emulator so that they do work. Um, yeah, no, no one. <laughs> I don't, yeah, you're not going to get too much. Um, so they, there is a built-in like graphic settings where you can put in like CRT mode and anti-alias. So they've tried to provide some visual filters, and there are some add-on patches that will allow the built-in emulator to do various sort of upscaling and softening and things like that. So you could try and squeeze a bit more life out of these games if you really wanted. I think Rogan has a question. So. Um, yeah, so I'm not a Linux kernel dev, so I don't know enough about this stuff, but it uses the standard joystick messages. So they've got a timestamp, they've got uh, like a message type, there's sort of a couple of fields that go into it. I assume that it had to do with the message date being wrong. I don't know if I'm gonna find this slide now. Um, but what I was able to do quite interestingly was cat the reset button device to a file push the reset button, which obviously the, the UI did its own thing, but I, was, I had a cat file, I could control C and have that cat file. And if I cat to that file back to the device, then the device could reset. So I could just keep feeding it back, but that same behavior didn't work for the joystick commands for some reason. So then I tried to do part of why I enjoyed your talk. I tried to actually read those commands out, swap out the timestamps in real time and feed them back in. Um, via orc and grep and the things you mentioned, also by just setting like really future date times, but they just didn't work at all, which I found quite strange. Looking online, it's definitely standard for Linux to allow the joystick device to be written to because you've got your force feedback joysticks, so I thought maybe it was a read-only device, which it wasn't. So it's one of the things I really wanted to get done. Uh, the embedded sort of Wi-Fi is something we wanted to get done. We wanted to try USB um, Ethernet. So there might be another talk in the future here. There's definitely a lot that we want to do poking at it, but yeah, I couldn't, I, I would love to bot it. I really just want a bot playing Mario on this device. Cool, yeah I, yeah, I don't know anything about that. As I say, the reset button worked, so I was like, hey, I can do the same for the joystick, and that didn't work, so that's cool. I would I'll definitely like to take a look at that. Because I could, um, I could absolutely record those events and analyze them offline, see, cool, here's the timestamp, here's the event type, and I can console log what should be happening. I just couldn't turn them back into commands. Okay, we're out of time, uh, but the device looks like this, which is super tiny, and that's what we've been running off of. Um, and do come chat to us afterwards about anything like retro or 8-bit and hardware hacky. Thanks, guys. <laughs>